and I will exalt him. You may take a seat. Thank you, Justin. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Pastor Chris, if you're here for the first time, or you're watching online for the first time on Facebook, YouTube, on our website, good to be back with you, and it's good to be back in the book of Exodus with you. I'm excited to jump back into it, the next stretch of the book of Exodus. Um, The other night, My family was having dinner together. We get to have dinner as a family maybe three times a week with different activities happening. It's 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 kind of a challenge. But the other night, it was last Sunday night actually. We were having dinner together, and after dinner, we were kind of like dancing, going on in the kitchen. And I put a song on my phone that I want to play for you guys, and I want to see if anybody can guess which one, which song this is, and who who sings it. Go ahead, tech team. Could you? Inside the pocket of your ripped jeans Holding me closer till our eyes meet You won't ever be alone All right, you guys can stop that. Wait for me to come home Who knows? Who knows what that song is? Who can, who can guess what the name of the song is and who sings it? You get a $10 quick check gift card. Any? No, you gotta get. You gotta have both. No, no, you gotta have both. Okay, anybody? Anybody? Who said it back there? Who? What? No, no, no. Who? Pat, Pat's Pat's nephew's got it. Anybody? Anybody? All right, Sarah Ann got the closest with the name of the singer, Ed Sheeran. Here, come on, Sarah. Boom. There you go. Bam. It's Ed Sheeran, and it's Photograph. It's a song called Photograph. Now, if you're wondering why would Pastor Chris play a secular song in the middle of a worship service, that is highly inappropriate. Why would he do that? I understand that. Here's why we did that. I played that song because that's a song that me and my oldest daughter, Kayla, used to dance to when she was little. Every time that song comes on, I'm moved in my heart and my mind and my soul to, and I'm not a dancer and I'm not a singer. I go to a wedding, I do not want to get up on the dance floor. But when that song comes on and I hear that, I am moved in my heart and in my mind to want to sing and sing it loudly and to want to dance and want to dance with my my daughter, Kayla, because it brings back memories of when she was younger. I asked her, I was like, do you remember dancing? She's like, no. But I do. She was like three, four at the time. I remember, and I want to dance with her, both as a celebration of my relationship with her, but also in memory of the moments we used to have when she was a little tyke. And um, this passage that we're looking at today in the book of Exodus is a song. It's the power of a song. it's, it's It's a hymn that was written by Moses right after this crossing of the Red Sea, right after God's uh, climax of saving them from the hand of the Egyptians. He leads them through the Red Sea. If you remember from Easter, the Egyptians come following after them. The Red Sea comes crashing down on the Egyptians. And as Justin just read, they are lying dead on the seashore and the Israelites burst out in a song of praise following Moses' lead, singing to God in remembrance, in celebration of what he had done. Now, keep in mind that they were not yet in the promised land that God had promised them. They weren't there yet. They didn't know how they were going to get there. They didn't know when they were going to get there. But they saw God's hand deliver them. And they're in between. And instead of turning right away and going, oh no, now what? How are we going to get there? They stopped and they marked that moment in time by celebrating who God is, remembering his acts, commemorating this moment of salvation. And you and I, we're in the land of in-between as well. If we've trusted in Jesus, we've been saved, we've been ransomed and redeemed from slavery to sin and death. But we are not yet in the promised land. The ultimate promised land that God has for us. A new heaven and a new earth with new resurrected bodies. We don't have that yet. We're in between. 
We're kind of in a, in, in a wilderness of sorts, and yet God has called us as his people to mark out moments in time by celebrating and remembering who he is, what he has done, both in the past in saving us, but also through all of life's ups and downs in our unique individual stories, to mark out and remember. And that today is called celebrating and remembering. The power of celebrating and remembering. We're going to be in Exodus 15, verses 1 through 21. And we're going to talk about five things. There's five things that I see in this passage about worship, about celebrating, about remembering. Both uh, in the lyrics themselves, but also in the act of singing, in the act of worshiping. I don't know about you guys, but I have a tendency in my heart. There's something still wrong with me, that I can pray for something, I can ask God to do something, and he does it. He actually comes through. He actually delivers, he saves, he steps in, he intervenes, he heals. And almost right away, my mind can quickly turn to the next hardship, the next difficulty, the next challenge. Anybody else like that? Instead of marking out that moment in time and giving thanks and going, Lord, look what you did. I go, oh, that's awesome. Anyway, now there's this, and we got to figure this one out. Now there's this next stretch of the journey that's confusing, and we got to come up with a plan here. And God has called us, if we want to experience more of his presence in our lives, anybody? More of his power in our lives, we are called to celebrate and remember and worship. So five things I want to point out from this passage. You can take notes. Those of you watching online, uh, it, it, uh, you'll be able to see it, but you can uh, share with each other in the chat room. You can kind of copy those notes. So um, try to follow along as best you can. We're going to um, repeat what Justin read for us. So we're going to start at the end of chapter 14, just so we're reminded of the context, and then we're going to lead right into chapter, chapter 15. Sound good? Awesome. Well, Lord Jesus, speak to us today. Move in our hearts and remind us of the power of celebrating and remembering and worshiping. Remind us and... Uh, Jesus, if there's just one of these five points for each of us to take with us and apply, would you highlight what that is in your name? Amen. Okay. This, this thing slid down. All right. Here we go. Chapter 14, starting in verse 30. It says, That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. Try to put yourselves in these guys' shoes. I mean, they're seeing dead bodies of their former oppressors lying on the seashore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Chapter 15. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. So right away, immediately, spontaneously, they responded by singing this song to the Lord. Now, the book of Exodus was not written right away. The book of Exodus was written years later before the people of Israel were going to enter the promised land. This song, however, was written right away. This song was written right after they saw God crushed the Egyptians and their former oppressors and slave drivers and taskmasters were lying dead on the seashore. They responded with a song of worship. So number one, worship is a response to God's saving work, not a way to earn God's salvation. Now, this is important because religion will tell you that you do these types of things like singing songs and hymns in order to get God to show you favor. You go to church and you sing a song and you go through the sacraments in order to get God to be pleased with you, to check it off the list so that God says, oh, okay, you went to church this week. Maybe I'll answer your prayers this week. 
But true worship is a response to what God has already done. It's a response to his saving works. It's a response to who he is. There's a movie called Eat, Pray, Love. I didn't see it, but I saw the trailer this week. It popped up on YouTube. Julia Roberts' character says to Viola's, Viola Davis' character, she says, I want to read you the quote. She says, I want to go to Italy. I want to go someplace where I can marvel at something. Language, gelato, spaghetti, something. I want to marvel at something. That's how we're wired. God has wired us to marvel at something, to gaze at and be in awe at and long for something, to respond to life with a, wow, ah, oh, that's awesome. Look at that. But most of all, we were wired to marvel at God himself. We were wired to marvel at who God is and what he has done for us. That's what worship is. It's marveling at, it's responding to what God has done for us. It's not a way to twist God's arm or to get God to owe us. It's not a way to initiate God and get him to do something. It's us responding to what he has initiated. That makes sense? It's why we're saved in the first place. It's why God rescues us and gets a hold of our hearts so that we would be free to marvel not at the things of life that are empty and perishing and fall apart, but to marvel at him who is always worthy of our worship and can sustain our worship. He ain't gonna let us down, in other words. You can marvel at some trinket and toy that you purchase off the internet, maybe something, you know, a new iPhone, you can marvel at that for a day. It's going to break. It's going to get wet. Something's going to happen to it, especially my phones, right? God's never going to let us down. Other relationships let us down. That new boyfriend, that new girlfriend that you marvel at for a few months, eventually they're going to let you down, but God doesn't. If you remember from the first few chapters of Exodus, from the first section, God said over and over again that he was going to redeem the slaves out of Egypt in order to... Anybody remember? I got a $50 Target gift card for anybody who remembers. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. But does anybody remember? God says, I'm going to redeem them. I'm going to rescue them in order to... Yes, that's true, Steve. That is true. But so that they could... Worship him. Yeah, check this out. Just check this out. Look how many times this shows up. Uh, I got stuck here, guys. Get me going again. Let my people go. This is chapter 5, verse 1. God said, let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Worship. Chapter 7, verse 16. Let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. Chapter 8, verse 1, let my people go so that they may worship me. Chapter 8, verse 20, let my people go so that they may worship me. Chapter 9, verse 1, let my people go so that they may worship me. Chapter 9, verse 13, let my people go so that they may worship me. Chapter 10, verse 3, let my people go so that they may worship me. You get it? God wants them to be free, not to be autonomous, independent people and just wander around on their own, do whatever you want. I'm going to rescue them so that they could worship me. God wants us to worship him, and that's why he saves us, and we worship him in response to his saving work. That's why we sing songs. That's why they sang a song. We're wired to sing. Now, singing is not the only way we worship God, mind you. There's many ways, but, but singing is one way that we are commanded over and over and over again in Scripture to worship God, to praise Him. Because God knows it's not a way to earn our salvation. It's not a way to earn His favor. But God knows that we are wired, because He's the one who did the wiring. We are wired to sing. There's something about singing that drives things from our head into our hearts. Now, some of us are self-conscious about singing, and so we can't, we have a hard time believing that, but God has wired us to sing and praise Him because it takes truths that we may know in our head, and it drills them into our hearts. 
And there's confirmation of this. There's studies that have, done, that, have, that have been done that show the psychological and physical benefits of singing. So you guys have probably heard some of these things. The Chicago Tribune did an article a few years ago citing a few studies that say that singing releases the hormone oxytocin, which, is a, uh, uh, which alleviates stress. It releases endorphins, the pleasure chemicals. It stimulates greater circulation. It, it, it's uh, of, of oxygen. It, it, that article cited a study from the University of Frankfurt, listen to this, which found that professional choir singers, they, they tested them before and after an hour-long session of singing, and they found that the uh, immunoglobulin A, you know, one, one of the, for your immune system, fighting off uh, diseases, was increased after sing, the singing session to such an extent that um, when they compared it to people who were just listening to music for an hour, it was, it was a huge contrast. In other words, listening to music doesn't do what actually singing does. There's something powerful about singing and doing it corporately that boosts immunoglobulin A. Another article in Healthline cites other studies which claims that um, singing improves speaking ability for people with autism, Parkinson's, stuttering problems, and even aphasia after a stroke. And then many of you guys know that the um, uh, folks with different types of dementia, the Alzheimer's Foundation says that listening and singing to familiar songs brings back autobiographical details from your life that you may have forgotten. It brings them to memory. There's something powerful about a song. So whether you like it or not, and again, I'm not a singer and I'm not a musician, but whether you not like it or not, God has wired us to express and respond to life through singing. And how much more should we respond to the God of life, the author of life, through song? So don't cut out early. Stop coming late. Stop treating singing as this optional time. It, that's for those people who like to sing. Now God has wired us all. Now singing again, it's not the only way we worship God. There's other ways. I can't mention them all today, but two things I'm going to mention are the sacraments of baptism and communion. Those are two other ways that we're commanded to worship God, to celebrate and remember who he is and what he, we, and what he has done. When we receive communion together, which we're going to do at the end of service. You all got the, the, the elements handed out to you. If you're watching at home, hopefully you're prepared. Get some bread, crackers, juice, or wine, something to join us afterwards. But when we receive communion together, we're remembering what God has done in his ultimate saving work through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. We're remembering it. We're fixing our hearts and our minds on his ultimate saving work on our behalf. And then there's baptism. And we got, Justin mentioned, we got a baptism coming up next week. Baptism is another way we worship. In fact, it is the first way that we are commanded to worship God after we trust in Jesus. It is the first act of obedience. God wants us to celebrate, to respond to our salvation by celebrating through the act of baptism. And it's a way that the whole church family gets to join in. The Bible says that angels rejoice when one sinner repents and turns back to him. They rejoice. They have a party. And you know what God wants us to do? He wants us to join the party. He wants us to join the party by going through the baptism and having the sacrament and having others join and go clapping and go, yes, because God's celebrating. And when we just kind of move on, God's like, no, stop, celebrate. Remember what I have done in this person's life. Join in on the celebration. It's why we're so big on baptism around here, and we're not too big on come down front and, you know, go do whatever other churches do. There's nothing wrong with that. But we just see the Bible says, you profess that Jesus is Lord, God raised him from the dead, you get baptized. It's a pretty simple deal. And when people say, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't need to get baptized in order to prove, uh, you know, my faith— I kind of, it's kind of like saying I don't need to celebrate my baby being born in order to prove that I love my baby. I don't need to post anything on social media. I don't need to tell my family. I don't need to take pictures. I don't need to send out texts saying, hey, good news, my baby was born. On one hand, that's true. You don't have to do those things to prove that you love your baby. On the other hand, it's not true. Because if you're, if it matters, you got to tell somebody. Amen? And if it matters that Jesus got a hold of my heart, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the very act that Jesus told me to go through in order to celebrate. This matters. I belong to Jesus. A new life has been put inside of me. So that's why we're so big on baptism. Some of y'all have put that off for too, too long. It's time to join in. Jump into it for next week. That's number one, first point. Worship is a response to God's saving work, not a way to earn his salvation. All right. Number one was long. The next four are going to be probably as long together as number one was. Let's start to work through some of the lyrics of the song. We're not going to go through this whole passage, by the way, because there's, there's, there's a reading plan, Monday through Friday reading plan that breaks this down in more detail. You jump into it. It's on our website already. You'll get an email t tomorrow, but it's already on our website. Uh, you can follow along in the reading. But let's start to work through this. Number, verse 1, or the first part of this song. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. So they're praising him. Uh, and they're, they're, notice the determination there. I will sing. I will praise. I will exalt. And they will exalt him for what? For his salvation. So number two, our worship is about what God has done, not how we feel. Now, this may sound similar to point number one, but it's a little bit different. I want to emphasize, I think it's important to emphasize that true worship is about what God has done. It's not based on how we're feeling in a given moment. Because how you feel in a given moment is somewhat unpredictable. And our feelings are fickle. And church people all too often, I hear it, pick up on it, probably do it myself. We say things like we leave a church service and we go, did you like the worship today? <laughs> I don't know if I was feeling the worship. They didn't have a full band. It was only Miguel and Amanda <laughs> up there. And they did some songs I didn't really recognize. What about you? Oh, I was feeling the worship. I thought the worship was good. I don't know. I want to check out other churches first before I decide. <laughs> right? That's what we do. And what are we saying? Worship is based on how I'm feeling in a moment. Instead of, what were the Israelites saying? I will exalt him. I will praise him. For what? For what he has done. He has hurled him into the sea. He's become my salvation. Who he is and what he's done. That's what they're praising him for. They're declaring their determination to praise him. He is the, he's the one who uh, uh, kept his covenant to their fathers. I will praise him, my father's God. They, God made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now they see it fulfilled when they look at these dead bodies on the seashore. Wow. That's, that's our father's God coming through for us. We got to see it with our eyes. We're going to praise him. Do you show up on Sunday mornings with the same determination? I'm going to sing. I'm going to praise. I'm going to exalt God for who he is. It don't matter if they're singing songs I like or not. It don't matter how I feel. It don't matter if I feel beaten up by life. I'm going to exalt him because he's my salvation. Do we have that same determination? Or do we show up kind of with our, our arms folded and our minds going, let's see if you guys can move me today. Let's see if you can move my heart. Mm, I don't know. I don't know if you did it. Right? Right? I mean, there's a little bit of that in all of us, isn't there? Move me. Inspire me. Instead of, no, I'm going I'm to show up with my family and we're going to praise our God. We're going to exalt him no matter how we're feeling. It's based on God's actions on our behalf, not how we're feeling in a moment. Pastor Shea said this to me in, a, in the, um, uh, he, he wrote this, uh, this this past week about this. He said, I cannot tell you how many times I've been in a church in a lousy frame of mind and heart, forced myself to worship anyway, and then a few minutes or a few songs in, found myself caught up into truly felt worship by the Spirit. The obedience came first, and then with it came blessing. I will, I will, I will. Praise our God. Now, same goes for communion. 
When we receive communion together, what are we determining? I will remember what Jesus has done. I might feel beaten up. I might have screwed up this week. I might be battling guilt and shame. I may be tempted to think that God doesn't love me. But this, these elements are a reminder that Jesus paid it all. I got nothing left to prove. There's nothing needed to be. Jesus proved it all on my behalf. And I'm remembering that no matter how I feel right now. No matter how much I'm, I'm tempted to battle shame right now for losing my temper this past week. I will remember and I will celebrate that Jesus paid it all on my behalf. And same with baptism. Sometimes people say, I don't feel ready to get baptized. I need to clean myself up or break this addiction or I should know the Bible more. And no, 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 no. Baptism is saying, no, I will get up in front of people and celebrate that Jesus has paid it all. I belong to him. He's going to complete the work he started in me. And y'all are going to celebrate with me even though y'all know how farther I need to grow. I will, I will, I will. I will praise him. I will exalt him. It's a determination based on what God has done, not on our feelings. That's number two. Let's keep going. Verse 3, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. He hurled the Egyptians into the sea. He drowned them. He covered them. They sank. He shattered the enemy. What are they doing? What are they singing about? What are they praising God for specifically here? His power. What do they call him in verse 3? The Lord is a what? He's a warrior. Number three, we are to celebrate God as a warrior. Oh, I love that. Now, some of you might be bothered by that. Warrior? That's Old Testament God. That's not New Testament, you're thinking? Jesus isn't a warrior in the New Testament. He's mild and tame. Carries lambs on his shoulders. Holds hands with the kids. He does do those things. But he's also a warrior. In fact, in the New Testament, he's arguably more of a warrior than he was in the Old Testament. What did he go around doing? He told sickness to get the heck out of here. He told demons to get the heck out of here. He went up against the religious leaders. He got in the ring with sin and death for our sakes and suffered in our place. Went to the cross. That's a warrior. And then he promises to return for us as a warrior. Let me, let me show you a little excerpt from Revelation 19. I'm not going to jump ahead to the last book of the Bible. Don't worry about flipping there. I'm just going to read a clip from Revelation 19 where it says in verse 11, I saw, this is John, the Apostle John speaking. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. And then verse 14, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. Ooh, that sounds like a warrior to me. And again, I know that that might be bothersome and troubling to some folks. But think about it. Think about it. Think about it. If God was not a warrior, if God was not a God who could be counted on to make war with the powers of Satan and sin and death and the grave, then you and I could not put confidence in him to, for saving us from those things. If you're taken by terrorists, who do you want coming after you to get you? A warrior or Mr. Rogers? A warrior. Now, listen, listen, I love Mr. Rogers. And if I'm hurting and sad, I want Mr. Rogers to sit by the fireplace with me and make me a cup of tea and talk with me. And God has a Mr. Rogers side to him. He does. But he's also got a warrior side. 
And when we're looking before us at the powers of Satan and sin, and we're feeling like, man, these things are coming against us, we need God to come through like a warrior. Crush these things, God. Do battle with these things on my behalf. And we can count on him to do it. Praise him for that. So we are to celebrate him. We are to praise him that he is a warrior God. You're going to come through. You're going to do battle with these things. He doesn't just pat us on the back and say, they're there now. I know it's hard. Although he does do that as well. But he says, I'm going to get those things for you. I'm going before you. I'm going to do battle with those things. Number four. We're to celebrate what God will do. Worship is about celebrating what God will do based on what he has done. Look at what the, let's jump down to verse 13 of this hymn. In your unfailing love, they sing. This is a part of the song still. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. So they're celebrating what God will do moving forward. Now, this particular verse was a comfort to me a few weeks ago when I was trying to get clarity on some things and there was some confusion and I couldn't make sense of things in my mind and I was like, God, I don't know which way to go here, A or B, I don't know. And I came across that verse and I was like, yes, God, you will lead those you have redeemed. He didn't just save the Israelites and then go, all right, y'all find the promised land on your own. Go figure it out. No, he led them there. He guided them there. Just like you and I, he saved us. When we trust in Jesus, he doesn't just say, all right, good luck. I'm returning one day. I hope you make it. Just, you know, no, he, he promises to lead us in this crazy life. Anybody need to hear that today? Anybody facing times of confusion? Decisions need to be made. A lack of clarity in your b fuzzy brain. Oh, rest in the promise that he will lead the people he has redeemed. And if that's you, if you've trusted in Jesus, that includes you. He will lead you. He will guide you. That's a promise. It's a promise to cling to. It's a promise to celebrate, to praise him for. Look, look, look at a few more verses. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. It hasn't happened yet. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall on them. By the power of your arm, they will be as st still as a stone until your people pass by, Lord, until the people you bought pass by. They're singing about how God will crush the people who are currently inhabiting the land that God promised them. It hasn't happened yet. But they're looking at the Egyptians dead on the seashore and they're going, well, if God did that, we can count on him to keep his promise to bring us back to the land of Canaan, the, back to the promised land. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands have established. The Lord reigns forever and ever. They are praising him for what he will do. You and I, are, we, we remember in worship what God has done, and then we look forward to the future promises. Because if we remember that God kept his promise to pay for our sin at the cross, he kept his promise to bring Jesus back from the dead, it gives us hope for the future. Oh, you will lead me. You will guide me. You will complete the work you started in me. You will return. You will save me from the very presence of evil in this world. You will. You will. You will. I'm going to declare it. I'm going to praise you for it. God wants us to worship him by declaring with our mouths what he will do, what he promises to do. Imagine on my wedding day, I, I stood up before Jess and all these people and I said, I promise to love, you know, cherish, honor you, rich, uh, sickness and health, rich or poor. Imagine Jess responded on our wedding day, right? Just picture this. She responded by saying, 
I sure hope you do those things. I don't know. I just kind of have my doubts. Like, I'd be pretty bummed. I want her to trust my promise, right? How much more the God of the universe, who's got, you know, who actually proved that he keeps his promises in the past, and he's like, now trust I'm going to keep the promises that are left to come. He wants us to declare that and say, yes, God, you will, you will, you will, instead of grumbling and complaining and, and being filled with fear and anxiety, as if, I don't know, God, I don't know if I can trust you anymore. I know you did those things in the past, but I don't know if you still do those things anymore. No, you will, God. You will, you will, you will. When we receive communion, the Apostle Paul says we are proclaiming the Lord's death, past, until he, what, comes again, future. We're proclaiming, you did this in the past. You saved me and ran, redeemed me. I'm going to celebrate this, celebrate this, celebrate this, celebrate this, celebrate this, until you return to complete and usher in your kingdom in its fullness. You will. We keep our minds and hearts focused on the future promises by celebrating what he will do. That brings us to number five. We worship God with our bodies. We worship God with our bodies. That might sound strange to some of you guys. Let me try to explain. Let's jump down to verse 19. This is the... Um, Epilogue. Verse 19. When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam, the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. Now notice, in the verses I just read, notice all the ways that their physical senses were engaged in worship. They, let's just back up. They saw Pharaoh's horses and horsemen crushed, right? They walked on dry ground. They felt the dry ground with their feet. They grabbed timbrels and they started to make music that they could hear with their ears. They started to sing with their mouths, right? And they started to dance with their bodies. The only thing not mentioned there is the sense of taste. But Pastor Shea pointed out they might have been kissing the dry ground that they got through, right? Who knows? God has made us embodied creatures. God has put us in physical bodies, and those physical bodies are meant to worship God with. You and I, Western Christianity has too often separated the spiritual from the physical. Like God only cares about the spiritual. He doesn't care about the, the physical. But no, God created creation. He, he declared it good in the beginning. Yes, it got screwed up, but what's he going to do? One day he's going to restore it all. He's got new bodies for us. We are going to have bodies forever to worship him with. And we're going to be on a new creation, a renewed creation to enjoy we worship him by enjoying this new creation forever and ever and ever. C.S. Lewis said, God likes matter. He invented it. So we are to worship him with that matter, especially with our bodies that he's put us inside. We are to use our bodies to worship him. We, we are not to be stoics. We are not to just kind of, you know, well, I worship him in my head. No. No. We're to, if it matters to us, we're to use our bodies to express it and to worship him. If it matters, we are to show that it matters with our physical body, to get in water and be baptized. We're to eat crackers and juice that we're about to do, right? It's a way of worshiping. We sing with our mouths. We move our hands in praise. We kneel in, in somber reflection and adoration. Now, yes, you might be thinking, well, I'm more introverted, or I'm shy, or I'm not as the physical affectionate type. That's fine. There's different kinds of moms out there. Some are shy and introverted. But any mom who hears her baby crying, she's going to scoop that baby up. She's going to nurture that baby. Doesn't matter if she's introverted personality or not. So you and I may use our bodies differently to worship God. Some like to pump their fists and others want to more prone to kneel. 
But we're called to use the matter that God has put our souls inside of to worship him. If he matters, we worship him with our bodies. So in summary of this whole thing, here's a summary statement. The proper response to God's saving work is worship. And the proper worship of God is grounded on his saving works. We're going to end service right now by worshiping him in three ways. Physically, in three ways. We're going to receive communion together. We're going to sing together. And then, however you feel led, you can use your body to worship him. Whether it's raising an arm or hands, two hands, or kneeling, or coming down front as a declaration of just, God, you're most important. You're the priority. But we're going to start by receiving communion. So, band, could you come on up here? And y'all can stand. And you can take the communion elements out. A Bible teacher named Vody Bachman in, out of Texas said this. For the believers prior to the cross, everything was about the exodus. It shaped their understanding of who God is, just like the cross of Jesus shapes our understanding of who God is. So for the Israelites, after this exodus, after the crossing of the Red Sea, they looked back on that as the pinnacle of God's saving work. As a reminder, God is faithful God is faithful. God cares about us. God hasn't forgotten. Look what he, remember what he did at the Exodus. But after Jesus came and died and rose again, that is what we look back on. That is what the people of God look back on as the pinnacle of his saving work. The cross of Jesus. Because you and I deserve to be like the Egyptians. drowned in God's wrath and fury. Slaves to sin, perpetrators of sin. If the Egyptian army was a foreshadow of our slavery to sin, Pharaoh is a foreshadow of Satan who's got us in his clutches and we had no power to free ourselves and save ourselves. And so God initiated God came after us. He got into human flesh. He got into a body. He did battle with Satan and sin and the grave. He got into the ring with our enemies. He let his body be pummeled and his blood get spilled. He took one punch after another. One blow after another. He was mocked and humiliated, scourged. And as his body was being shredded, as blood drenched the streets of Jerusalem, and trailed all the way to the hill called Golgotha. As his wrists were nailed to the cross and his feet nailed to the cross, it looked like our warrior God had lost. When his body breathed its last and was put in a tomb it looked like there was no hope. The battle that our warrior God came to fight was over. And then a few days later, 
on the first day of a new week, the ground began to rumble. The earth began to shake. That body began to breathe again. Blood began to circulate in its body. Oxygen filled its lungs. Grave clothes were torn off. And the stone was rolled away. God showed himself to be the victor, the king, the risen one, the conqueror. So that you and I could be free. So that you and I could be free. So that you and I could be free. We do this in remembrance of, of, of that, of him. Let's receive the cracker together. And let's drink the cup together. And let's sing together and praise him for all those things. Not listen to music, but sing.